Well, we started off this sermon series by saying that a Christian disciple at its core is a person who's living out the great commandment and the great commission. Certainly there can be more added to that than those two things, but it can't be less than that. I think we all have come to agree on that. To be a disciple of Christ is to, at its core, be a person who is committed to loving God and loving others and making disciples. We've looked at how discipleship starts with illumination, a combination of knowing and studying the scriptures and God adding to that knowledge the conviction that it's true and seeing the beauty and awesomeness of God and seeing holiness as desirable and therefore sin as undesirable. That illumination leads to incarnation. Knowing the truth leads to practicing the truth. And then incarnation moves to impartation. If loving God and loving others is the thing that God wants us doing, then helping other people love God and love others is probably a really good thing to be doing. And that's what discipleship is. Loving God and loving others moves us to make disciples. Discipleship, as we have seen, is a way of life. It's relational. It's an intentional relationship that we pursue with Christ and other people. And over the past couple of weeks, we've looked at some of the things that we should expect as we disciple others. We should expect it to look like an apprenticeship. We should expect it that, that uh, we've looked at the importance of understanding that discipleship can be messy, confusing, and perplexing. And all of this we can see in our passage today, John 4, 1 to 42. This is the passage where Jesus meets the woman at the well. Don't worry, I am not going to read all 42 verses. But I'm going to take us through that passage and I'll be pointing out the various verses that I want to focus on as I go through the story. So you can open your Bible and follow along, but we're going to get going and I'm going to hold your feet to the fire, okay? Because Jesus knew that the Pharisees were aware of his baptizing disciples and that it was now starting to exceed John the Baptist's baptizing of disciples, he left Judea for Galilee. Verse 4 says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Had. True, that was the fastest and most direct route, but it wasn't the only way to get there. In fact, for a good Jew, and certainly for a good rabbi, it was the most undesirable way to get there. Such was the level of ethnic and religious and political animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans, that it was the practice of the Jews to avoid that route and go around Samaria, adding a whole other day to their journey. That was more preferable than going through Samaria. So just by this simple act of stepping into Samaritan territory, Jesus was doing what no respectable Jew and the least respectable rabbi would have done in his time. Once they arrived in Sychar, Jesus stops to rest and sits on the well in verse 6 and sends his disciples off into town to find some food. So here's Jesus sitting on a well by himself at noon and a Samaritan woman comes to draw water, verse 7. The awkwardness of this scenario, I think, is really missed on us today. And uh, hearing this from a Middle Eastern perspective, I think, would be shocking, and especially if you knew the culture at that time. First, there is the awkwardness of finding a Jew sitting on a Samaritan well. Things get more awkward when Jesus doesn't move away. Had Jesus followed the custom of the day, seeing that a woman was approaching the well, he would have gotten up 
and moved a good distance away to let her know that he wasn't the danger and that he didn't have bad intentions. But he ignores this and just sits there and watches her come up to him. Jesus was on the well, and he was not going to get up. It was also weird that this woman is coming at noon in the middle of the day to draw water. It was the hottest time of the day. And women typically would go either in the morning or in the evening to get water. And they wouldn't go alone. They'd go in groups. Because putting a full water jar on your head by yourself is not the easiest thing to do. And it's a lot safer to be in a group than it is going by yourself. And why would you do it at the hottest part of the day? It's hot, hard work. <clears throat> the only reason for her being there alone at this time of day was because she had thought the well would be abandoned and empty and she wouldn't have to talk to anybody. For Jesus, a man and a Jew, to continue sitting on the well, while this strange and questionable woman was right next to him to draw water with no witnesses around them to see what was going on was very unorthodox to say the very least. Both Jesus and the woman were doing things that would be looked down upon by Jews and Samaritans alike. Are you starting to see how awkward this is? If things were awkward now, they were about to get worse. Jesus speaks to her in verse 7, will you give me a drink? That was just not done. This is something no Middle Easterner would have done then, and I don't think they would do now. She was a woman. She was a strange woman. She was a Samaritan woman. She was an immoral woman. This would be like Billy Graham standing next to a vending machine while a prostitute walks up, walks up to it, gets herself a Pepsi, and then while she's drinking it, he says, hey, could I have a sip of that? Wouldn't that be weird? The Samaritan woman said to him in verse 9, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman, so how can you ask me for a drink? Her question both expresses surprise and to be honest, it's a little bit provocative. It expressed surprise in that the Jews would not share or use vessels together with Samaritans. To ask for a drink from her bucket and from her cup was unheard of. And it's a bit provocative because the word Samaritan here is feminine, which by itself means a Samaritan woman. But the, in the Greek, Two words are used, that word for a Samaritan woman and then the word for woman. There is no reason to say it twice. And it was plain she was a woman. It seems that she was probing to see what his intentions were. After all, he'd not done the proprietary thing by moving away. What did he want? Whatever her meaning, Jesus ignores her question and tells her in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Wells did not have buckets attached to them. You had to bring your own. And she sees that Jesus didn't have any means to draw up any kind of water, living or not. Basically, she sizes him up and says, right, how are you going to do that? You don't have a bucket. Do you know who gave us this well? Our father Jacob. Do you think you're greater than him? Now, many self, any self-respecting Jew would have taken offense at that. How could a Samaritan claim? Jacob as their father. They had intermarried with Gentiles for so long. How could they possibly do such a thing? This was a, both a racial and political jab that she was giving Jesus. But again, Jesus just ignores her question. He doesn't get into racial or political argument. He simply replies in verse 13 and 14, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. 
Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. It is interesting that she says, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus offers water that wells up to eternal life, but all she seems to have heard was, you won't ever be thirsty again. She's basically saying, if there really is such a thing, how great would that be for me to never thirst, to never have to carry water back and forth, to never subject myself to the humiliation of coming to this well here by myself in the middle of the day to draw water. If there's such a thing like that, I would love it. But Jesus was not offering a pool, but a spring of living water. In fact, living water means water that's moving. A stream or a river as opposed to a standing water in a pond or a well. It's the nature of springs to flow out. So Jesus, unconcerned that she doesn't understand about what he's doing for her, giving her what she should have asked him for, he begins the flowing of the spring he has created in her. Go, he says, call your husband and come back. As a woman, she could not witness to her husband or to any man in that culture. Jesus' request is very countercultural. She counters by saying she doesn't have anyone to go back and get. <laughs> Jesus shocks her yet again by agreeing and saying that she's been honest and goes on to tell her what she left out that she not only didn't have a husband, but she's had five husbands. What she said is quite true. What to do? I know. I'll change the subject. <laughs> Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. This time, Jesus answers her question. And he never returns to the issues of her sin. For centuries, debate had gone on between the Jews and Samaritans about the place where worshiping God was proper. And Jesus tells her that while the Samaritans did not have all the knowledge about God they needed to know, because all they followed for scripture was the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they didn't follow anything else, so their knowledge was stunted. But at this point, it doesn't matter because a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. The God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. While she didn't have the benefit of knowing all scripture, she knew enough to know that the Messiah was coming. And she says, when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Just then, the disciples come back. And for all the reasons we've been talking about, they're speechless. You understand now why they were like not saying anything? Why would Jesus put himself and this woman in such a compromising position? Why would he do it with a Samaritan woman? With this woman? The situation is so unexpected that they keep their questions to themselves. That's what it says in verse 27. But the spring of living water that Jesus was offering has been given, and now it starts to flow. She leaves her jar and returns back to the town in verse 28. But she doesn't just go home to the man she was living with. She tells the town, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they come to see who she was talking about. The disciples chose to ignore what they saw and offer Jesus some food that they brought back from the market. I have food to eat that you know nothing about, Jesus says. What else happened while we were gone? <laughs> they start to wonder. Did somebody give him food? 
As the woman thought Jesus was talking about drinking water when he talked about living water, the disciples misunderstood what Jesus was talking about. As grace quenches the thirst of the heart, discipleship, loving God and loving others and helping others do the same is nourishment that is satisfying to the soul. They'd gone into the town to buy food, but had missed the spiritual feast that God had set before them. Jesus spells it out. Don't you have a saying, it's four months until the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. And verse 39 is stunning. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Her testimony should not have meant anything in that culture. But it is the nature of springs to flow outward. And once divine grace starts to flow, it begins to multiply. The people ask Jesus to stay, and he does for another two days. The capstone is verse 42. The townspeople tell the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. We have now heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. What I want us to realize from this passage is that discipleship is spirit-led. This passage shows three ways in which this happens. First, we need to follow the Spirit's leading in where we are to go to make disciples. As Jesus told this woman first to go call her husband, certainly it teaches that our primary place of discipleship should be our house, our home, our family, where we're living. But it also teaches that Jesus was led to go to Samaria. Sometimes the Spirit is going to lead us into places that we or others would not otherwise go to or think of as a good idea to go to. Second, we need to follow the Spirit's lead in leading whom we should disciple. Jesus had followers that were upstanding people in the community like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. But most of the moral and religious people of Jesus' day thought that he was going to all the wrong people. He was often accused of hanging out with sinners. And some of these people he made his closest friends and disciples. I don't know any culture where fishermen are seen as really nice, well-dressed, well-spoken, gentlemanly, aristocratic kind of people who never cuss. Do you? No. Who is Jesus with? Fishermen. And then he goes and gets Matthew, Levi, a tax collector. You know how they made their money? By collecting more than the tax. And who did they give it to? The oppressive Roman government. They were seen as traitors. They were seen as extortionists. You had Simon the Zealot, a member of a volunteer militia who advocated the use of force against Rome. And then there's this woman who was the poster child of who a good Jew should avoid at all costs. These were not people we would think God would use But if we read scripture honestly, they are the ones he loves to draw to himself and the ones he tends to work through the most. And third, we need to follow the Spirit's leading into areas we work with those we are discipling. This woman at the well asked what in culture was a very provocative question. Jesus ignored it. She then opens the door to a racial and political discussion by challenging the Jewish claim to Jacob's well and his ancestry at the exclusion of the Samaritans. Again, Jesus ignores the question. Just because we're given an opening doesn't follow that that's where the Spirit wants us to go. It's important that when we're discipling people, especially when we're making new disciples, when people who are not yet following Jesus, that we don't just go after every point. 
This woman had a serious moral problem. We can all agree with that, right? One that Jesus picked up on and gently exposed. It stung to be so exposed. And so she changes the conversation away from it. And Jesus left it too. Was that an area in her life that needed more work? Yes, absolutely it was. But it was not where the spirit was working in her in that time. So Jesus moved off of it. One of the things I've been learning is that while I might see a number of places in a person's heart and soul that need addressed by the spirit, the spirit is not always working where I might want him working at that moment in their life. You know what I'm saying? Trying to work conviction into a person in an area that the spirit is not trying to work conviction is a very dangerous thing. It is the spirit's job to convict, not mine. And you know what? The spirit is really good at it. In fact, he's perfect at it. He knows best how to heal and to save I need to follow his lead. Following my lead is only going to lead to pain and trouble. We need to be in tune with the spirit if we're going to grow into mature disciples and disciplers of God's people. How do we do that? By being in tune with the spirit first requires that we hear the tune, right? You need ears to hear it. And anytime you want to hear what God is saying, just read the scripture. We all know uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching and rebuking. Second, it requires that we know the tune. We not only need to hear it, but we need to understand what we hear. We need to discern what the Spirit is doing and what his goals are. It's a tune that sings to the glory of God the Father, that announces that Jesus has come and conquered sin and death and established his kingdom, and that that is really good news. It's the best news. And third, it requires that we carry the tune. We not only need to hear the Spirit and understand the Spirit, but we need to live by the Spirit. The Spirit that created a spring of living water in the Samaritan woman does the same for every man, woman, and child that reaches out to Jesus in faith. That spring creates in us a desire and a potential to love God with all we have and then overflows to our neighbors and ourselves and flows out further into making disciples. How that happens is going to be different from person to person because no two people are exactly the same. There's going to be common things. There's going to be things that are very similar, but no one is going to have exactly the same experience as somebody else. We need to submit to the Spirit's leading. We need to have the courage to submit to the Spirit's leading when it's clear that he's convicting a person in a certain way or on a certain point. And that may be hard for us, And it may be hard for the person to hear that we are discipling. But it's also important for us to have the courage to hold back what we want to say when the spirit is not leading or working where the area is we want to talk about. While the spirit of Christ is going to be convicting us and convincing us and changing us so that we can more reflect the love and character of Christ, we need to be careful that satisfaction, that sanctification doesn't become an idol to us. You know that? Fenlon, I think, said it best. There is something about your suffering which is very subtle and perhaps hard for you to understand. Even though you are convinced that your first concern is for the glory of God, Yet in your inmost soul, it is the old self which keeps causing you so much trouble. The way I see the problem is this. I think that you really want God to be glorified in your life. But you think that this is going to be accomplished by becoming more and more perfect. 
And in doing this, you are still thinking about your own personal worth. Ask God to give you ears to hear his spirit. Read and study the scriptures so that you not only recognize his voice, but understand what he's doing. One of the things he's doing in every Christian is moving them to love God with all their heart and loving their neighbors themselves. And another is to be making disciples, helping others learn to love God and love others and make disciples. Be willing to submit yourselves to his leading. Where is he leading you to go? Be open to the idea that he may lead you to places that you wouldn't think to go or want to go or to people you wouldn't want to go to. Who is he wanting you to disciple? When you find yourself in one of these divine appointments, be it with somebody you might meet only once, like with the woman at the well, or somebody you might be a spiritual mother or father to, like Jesus was to his disciples, Where is the spirit leading you to work in that person? Don't take the lead, but follow where he leads. Amen? Amen.